In today's video, we're going to simulate particles interacting in a Leonard Jones potential in Python. So the steps we're going to follow are going to be very similar to the ones we used for the ideal gas video. So I really recommend you go check out my previous video first. The only difference here is that we'll be using periodic boundary conditions and we're going to have to change our methods for integrating the equations of motions since there are not going to be forces between the particles. So let's state the assumptions we're making to implement this uh, simulation. So the particles will be represented by circles that all have the same radius and mass. The particles start at random positions with random velocities and the particles can only interact with each other through the Leonard Jones potential. Finally, we'll use periodic boundary conditions, which means that if a particle leaves our box, it needs to appear on the other side. Okay, so with these assumptions in mind, the idea behind the algorithm is very simple. All we need to do is fix the number of particles, the size of our box and the duration of the simulation. Then we initialize the particles positions and velocities. And then at each step T, we need to find the forces acting on all the particles. And then we numerically integrate the equations of motion to evolve the positions and velocities from time T to time T plus delta T. Okay, so before we start coding this up, it's good to discuss what the Leonard Jones potential is. Okay, so the Leonard Jones potential between two particles is given by this expression. Okay, so you see it depends on r, which is the distance between two, the two particles. And there's also these two constants, epsilon and sigma, which set the energy and length scales. So in our video, we're just going to set them to one. The other thing that we can notice is that this potential is going to approach zero very rapidly when the distance between the particles increases. So it's very common to introduce a cutoff distance RC such that the potential vanishes for distance greater than RC. Okay. So for this simulation, we'll take RC to be 2.5 units of sigma or just 2.5. Right. So now we can just import the libraries we need. So we need NumPy, Matplotlib and uh, iter tools. And the other things are just for displaying the animations later on. Okay. And the first thing we can do is we can actually plot the uh, Leonard Jones potential for a range of values R. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do there, right? So this is what the Leonard Jones potential looks as a function of R. Okay, so we see that we have this 1 over R to the 12 term, which captures short range repulsive interactions between the particles. Okay, so we see that it's, it's very dominant at small distances. And then we have this term in 1 over R to the 6, which captures long range attractive forces between the particles. Okay. And then there's a stable equilibrium at the minimum of the potential. And this vertical line is the cutoff distance I've introduced. And we see that the potential is very close to zero when R is greater than RC. Okay. And for those of you that are interested, you can actually read more about the Leonard Jones potential in this article uh, that I've linked uh, to the notebook. The next step is to set up the initial conditions for this simulation. So we need to initialize our variables and set the initial positions and velocities. And the method I'm using here is exactly the same than what I did for the ideal gas video. So first I'm defining the number of particles, the radius of the particles, the size of my box, the duration of the simulation in seconds, the number of steps, the small time step dt between you know, two adjacent frames, and then the initial velocity magnitude of my particles. So remember, in the, in the other video, what we did is we initialized the positions at t equals zero on a grid, and this was to make sure that the particles aren't overlapping with one another. Okay, so this is exactly what I'm doing here. So I'm having my particles, uh, you know, standing on this grid at the initial time. And then for the velocities, okay, I'm doing the same thing again. I'm having my, veloc my particles all start with the same velocity magnitude, but with velocity vectors pointing in different directions. And so this is what this small code block over here does. Okay, so let's run this. And again, we can, we can actually plot our particles at the initial time to see if everything looks fine. Okay, so you see we have our particles sitting on this grid and none of them are overlapping, so we're happy. So now that we've set up our animation's initial conditions, it's time to start thinking at how we can compute the forces between the particles. So actually the Leonard Jones potential induces a force that is proportional to the gradient of ULJ. And it's actually given by this expression over there. And this is a force that a particle exerts on another particle due to the Leonard Jones potential. And as you can see, it depends on this vector r between the two particles and the distance between the two particles. So we first need to write a function that computes, you know, this vector between the two particles using periodic boundary conditions. So when we're using periodic boundary conditions, we're actually simulating an infinite system. So we need to choose the vector r 
between the two particles, which is R2 minus R1, such that its norm is the smallest between all replicas of the box. So to show you what I mean, I've written some code to do a small um, demonstration. Okay, so let's imagine that we're trying to simulate, you know, the particles in this central box. So these two red particles, right? And we're using periodic boundary conditions. So this means that we can actually imagine our entire plane being tiled by identical replicas of this central box. So for example, you see that if the red particle moved to the other box, then the black particle is going to come back into the central box. So this is what it means to use periodic boundary conditions. So you see that if we want the distance between this guy and this guy, right, we need to choose the distance that's, a, that's the smallest between all replicas of the box. So actually it would correspond to this distance. Okay, so we need to write a function that does this correctly. Okay, so it's going to be called pair vector and it calculates the vector R2 minus R1 with periodic boundary conditions. So the first thing we need to do is compute the raw difference vector. So we're going to call this R and that's going to be equal to R2 minus R1. And then we need to apply the periodic boundary conditions. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say that R minus equals numpy dot R int R divided by L times L. So what I'm basically doing here is I'm subtracting uh, something. And this thing is I'm rounding R over L to the nearest integer and then I'm dividing it by L. And what this does is it actually counts how many times my vector is wrapping around the, the box. Okay, so this is how we get the, di the difference vector between two particles, right, using periodic boundary conditions. So now that we have this, we can actually calculate the force acting on a particle at position R1 due to another particle at position R2. And we need to make sure we cut the force off for R greater than RC. So let's complete this function called force. Okay. So first we need to get the vector between the particles. So we're going to say that R is going to be pair vector R1, R2, and L. Okay, then we need the distance. Okay, so we're going to call this dist, and that's going to be equal to the norm of R. So numpy.linalg dot norm R. And then we need to calculate the forces. So there's two cases. Either the distance is less than RC, and we have to do some computation, or if it's greater than RC, then we just return a bunch of zeros. Okay, so if dist is less than RC, okay, then we have to return. So we have to use the expression written over there. So 24 over R to the 8 minus 48 over R to the 14. 24 divided by R to the power 8 minus 48 divided by R to the power 14 times the vector R. Okay, and in the other case, else we just return numpy dot zeros 2, right? Because if the particles are too far apart, there's no force, right? That's what we're doing. That's what we did when we introduced this cutoff distance. Okay. So now we found a way to calculate the force between two particles. And what we need to do now is we need to use this to get the equations of motion for each particle. So the equation of motion for a particle I at time T is given by Newton's second law. So this just says that mass times acceleration is equal to the net force felt by particle I. And actually the net force felt by particle I is the sum of all the forces that the particles J are exerting on particle I. So at every step of our simulation, we need to know what the net force, what is the net force felt by all particles. So we need to write a function that takes in the positions of our particles at a certain time and then stores the force felt by each particle. So to make things simple, we'll set M equals one. So to summarize what we need to do, okay, we need to implement the following. So we need to loop through all the particles I, then we need to loop through all the particles J that are different from I, and then calculate the force on particle I due to, the, uh, due to these other particles J. Actually, when we do this, we can be a little bit clever, okay, because we know from Newton's third law that the force felt by I due to J is minus the force felt by J due to I. So we can basically get away by only doing the second loop for J greater than I, which is going to make the algorithm slightly more efficient. And this step is actually the most expensive part of the simulation since we need to do about n squares operation, uh, n squared operations each time. So finding small ways to optimize this uh, is very important. Okay, so we're going to complete this function called get forces, which takes in the positions and the length of the box. So first I'm initializing an empty array to store the net force felt by each particle. 
Okay, so there's two n particles, and each particle has a force which is a 2D vector. So the shape is n2. And then we need to loop over all particles i. So for i in range n. Okay, then I just loop through all particles j greater than i. So for j in range i plus 1 to n. Okay, then I say, so my r1, r2 is going to be position i, positions j. So these are the positions of particles i and j. Okay, and then I just go in my forces array, right? So forces i, and I add to the force i the contribution from uh, particle j. So I just add force um, r1, r2, and l. Okay. Force, so add the contribution from j. And then I can just actually copy this and do a slight change. So now I'm going to add the force from particle i on particle j, which is going to be minus of that. So add the contribution from i. Okay. So this is how we get all the forces given an array of the positions. Okay. So now that we have this, all we need to do is we need to find a way to do a discrete integration of the equations of motion. So we need to evolve the particles, positions, and velocities from time t to time t plus delta t. And to do this, we'll use a popular molecular dynamics algorithm, which is called the velocity valet algorithm. And if you're interested in reading more about it, I've added a link. So to see how the velocity valet algorithm works, we can start by Taylor expanding ri of t plus delta t about delta t equals zero. So that's going to be ri of t plus vi of t times delta t plus delta t squared over two times the acceleration plus some higher order terms. Okay, remember the acceleration is the net force over the mass. And actually this gives us the positions of the particles at the next time step with an error of order delta t cubed. So this, ha this is how we're going to update our positions. Then to update our velocities, we're going to use this, okay? So vi of t plus delta t is the current velocity plus delta t times the average acceleration between time t plus delta t and time t. And we have also some higher order terms. And this gives us the velocities of the particles at the next time step with an error of order delta t squared. So basically, what we need to do at each time step is we need to use the current positions and velocities to get the forces acting on the particles at times t. Then we need to implement the equation for r of t plus delta t, so evolve our positions. Then we need to use our positions to get the forces acting on the particles at the next time step, which is going to allow us to get the acceleration at the next time step. And once we have all this, we can implement the equation for updating the velocities. Okay? So let's run this function called step, and let's complete this function. All right, so first we need to get the forces acting on each particle at the current time. So we're going to call this current forces, okay, and that's going to be used by calling get forces on positions and L, right? So this is the current forces. So now we need to update the positions of the particles using the current velocities and current forces, okay? So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to say that um, positions plus equals, right? So it's the current one plus dt times velocities plus 0 0.5 times dt squared times current forces, right? So these are my updated positions. And then with these updated positions, we need to get the new forces. So now we call forces on the new positions. So I'm going to call this new forces new forces, so I get the forces, and now we have the new forces and the old ones, or the current ones, we can get the um, increment in the velocity, right? So velocities equals, so plus equals the current one, plus 0 0.5 times dt times current forces plus new forces, okay? So this is basically the function we're going to call at each step to evolve our animation forward in time. Okay, so now we actually we actually have all the ingredients we need to run our simulation. So I've written this function called animate, and what it does is it stores all the positions and all the velocities of the animation, and it evolves the animation. So what I'm doing is I iterate through all steps, 
I store my arrays, and then I use the step function we've defined above to evolve the positions and the velocities. Okay, so this is what I'm doing. So let's run this function. So it takes a bit of time, right? So we're going to run it for uh, uh, 100 particles and let's see what happens. Okay, so it's done running and we see that it took quite a bit of time for 100 particles. So if you're trying to run this on your computer and it's a bit slower, you can lower the number of particles and it will run quicker. Okay, so before we actually do our animation, it's time to do a few sanity checks. So it's always important to check when we're doing uh, a physics simulation that the data we get is consistent with what we expect. For example, we expect that the mechanical energy of the system, so kinetic plus potential, should be conserved since the force from the Leonard Jones potential is conservative. So what I'm doing here is I'm writing a function, so I'm writing a loop to compute the potential energy of the system at each step and the kinetic energy of the system at each step, and then I'm going to plot these to see if the total energy is conserved. So let's run this, it takes a bit of time. Okay, so let's plot it now. Okay. So we see that our total energy, which is the green line, basically remains constant over time. So that means that the energy is being conserved by our simulation. So this is a, a physically consistent result. Okay. The next thing we can do is we can also check the equilibrium velocity distribution. So once our system thermalizes, we expect the velocity distribution to follow the 2D Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, given by this expression. So KBT is the average kinetic energy per particle. Okay, so let's explicitly check this. So what we can do is we can compute KT by getting the mean kinetic energy after the system has reached equilibrium. Okay, that's why I'm, I'm emitting the first 200 data points. Then we have a function for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And then what I'm doing is I'm uh, computing the, the norm of the speeds of all my, of the velocities of all my particles at all times, and I'm plotting them on a histogram. Okay, so let's see it how this looks. Okay, so we see that our simulation data fits almost perfectly the Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, distribution curve. Okay, so now that we convince our results make sense, let's animate our particles evolving uh, with varying colors. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm normalizing the speeds of my particles and I'm using the same code than last time, so I'm animating my all positions array. Okay, so you see here I'm just putting this modulo L to put the particles back into the box. And I'm also using a color map, so I assign a color to each speed, and then when I plot the particle, it gets that color. So we're going to see the particles changing color to show that it changes speed. So let's run this and save, save it as a video. Okay, so it ran, and normally it saved a video in, uh, on my laptop, and you see that we get this really cool looking animation of our particles moving around and evolving under the Leonard Jones potential. So yeah, thank you very much for watching.